uh, next uh, presentation and uh, next talk will be given by the uh, Bertrand Mayer, who is a professor of uh, Shalhassan Institute of also uh, a provost. Uh, he worked uh, before in many places, uh, including in a Polish university, Moy University, PH uh, uh, Milan University, and the University of Toulouse. Uh, he is uh, uh, one of the creators of AFIL uh, language, and today we'll give, uh, he'll give us a new talk that uh, will relate it to uh, restoring the uh, uh, belief in a uh, punch uh, uh, clause. Please thank you, Bertrand, for your agreement to give a talk, and uh, uh, please take the time to give a talk, and you can invite your colleagues who you want to uh, participate as well. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Alexander. Can you hear me well? Bertrand, we cannot hear you. You, uh, you cannot see me? Uh, I, I was... I, I can I hear you well, Bertrand. I think it's on the uh, in the 106 room. Everyone else, I think, is fine. Okay. Uh, but they said you could not see me. Is that? We can see you well too. Okay, good. So, do I still have forty-five minutes, or should I make it shorter? Because we we're studying a bit. We're studying uh, ten minutes late. So I just want to know because if what, what's the convention? Do do I have to shorten my presentation, or or do we delay a bit the the end? I think it would be better if we delay it, and there is no need to short. Okay, great. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present this material. I guess I should share my screen. You see, can you see my screen? Yes, everything is good. Okay, so uh, again, thanks for the invitation. This is going to be a talk about programming methodology and software verification. So I understand this is not necessarily the background of uh, all of you. I guess many of you have more of a robotics background. I've actually done work in robotics uh, software myself, but uh, nothing worth, uh, pre nothing recent. Uh, worth presenting here. So I chose with the organizers uh, permission a, a different topic. I'm going to explain everything. So if you do, if you don't have a background or a strong background in software verification or a programming methodology, you should be able to to understand. And maybe that will give you a re uh, another justification why you chose not to specialize in software verification. So this is work which I'm uh, doing with a number of colleagues from the Schaffhausen Institute of Technology, Alexander Kalkitankov and Alexander Naumchev, and uh, with a student from the University of Toulouse, Alisa Kadova, and it also benefits from earlier work with my former colleagues at ETH Zurich. One way to start is to refer to this video uh, by um, uh, which it's it's an extract from a uh, cult movie. A Night at the Opera by the Marx Brothers, and the, the, the scene itself is a cult uh, scene. I'm going to show some of it. I think it takes about five minutes. Uh, I don't want to show maybe to, maybe to show the full five minutes, but I'll show the beginning and the end. Okay, so it goes on like this for a while, uh, and I, I would like, to, well, you can easily find it on YouTube. Let me show you the end. I'm sorry to interrupt, Bertrand, but we cannot hear the video sound. Probably need to switch some settings in the videos or something. Uh, okay, okay uh, I tried. Uh, if I, uh, what if, I, if I'm not in uh, our presentation mode? No, we can only hear your mic. 
Yeah, but my mic should pick it up, so it's too smart. Okay. Uh, I okay. I don't know what to do, so I, I guess uh, uh, I'll just tell you what they are saying. It's really too bad. So look it up on YouTube. Uh, and um, the, the the end of the scene is uh, Groucho uh, saying. Uh, this is in every contract is called a sanity clause. So it's a clause uh, which says that if one of the parties Im is impaired, uh, then the contract is null and, and, and void. And uh, uh, Chico famously uh, responds, uh, you can't fool me. Uh, there ain't no sanity clause, which is a pretty good joke as, as they go. So the uh, and the whole uh, purpose of this talk is to restore the belief in a sanity clause. We are going to see that there is a notion of sanity clause in programming, in object-oriented programming specifically, and uh, that unfortunately it's subject to uh, many uh, deficient, to, to some uh, limitations and deficiencies. That is to say, the idea, although very elegant initially, actually breaks down when you consider the context of real practical object-oriented uh, programming. And for, so that notion is the notion of class invariant, which comes from a paper by Tony Hoare in 1972, where he wrote, well, the, the paper was called Proof of Correctness of Data Representations, how to prove correctness properties of data. You know, Dijkstra and others were worried about the correctness of programs, and he went into the correctness of uh, data. And he says, in order to uh, reason about data, we need, and reading here, we need uh, the programmer to give an invariant condition I of various objects and uh, defining some relationship between the constituent concrete uh, variables. And this is the notion of class invariant. He calls it I, and uh, the word invariant of the class or the expression invariant of the class appears in that paper for the first time. So uh, this, uh, these things are indeed everywhere in uh, programming, whenever we manipulate data structures, uh, it, they're not just arbitrary sequences of bits or integers or characters and pointers. They actually they actually satisfy some consistency constraint. An example of a consistency constraint, which would yield a class invariant in the corresponding object-oriented program, is the famous accounting equation. At least it's famous among uh, accountants. I don't assume there are any accountants in the audience, but well, this is from uh, Wikipedia. Our assets equals liability plus equity. So imagine an object uh, which represents uh, the which represents a company, and there's going to be field asset and a field liabilities and a field equity. Well, uh, the three values are not arbitrary; they have to match according to this equation. I'm going to take a similar example in a second. So this is the notion of class invariant. And if you look at the history of an object, the class invariant characterizes that history in a very clean and elegant way. So consider an object in object oriented programming. Uh, the object gets created. I'm using the Eiffel syntax here in uh, Java or C++, it would be a new. Okay? X receives new of blah, 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 of something. So it enters the first state S1, uh, and then after that, the life of, of an object is uh, pretty routine, pretty boring. Well, what happens is that uh, clients and you know, other objects call operations on you, uh, variously called methods, routines, or as a more general term, uh, features like F. So uh, some client calls x.f on you, where x is you, is the, is the target object. So you get from S1 to a new state S2, and uh, so on until the end of execution, right? You, so the object goes from state to state as a result of these so-called qualified call. I'm going to call this thing x.f a qualified call. It's qualified because there's x before, you know, it's a routine qualified by a name, and the object can only be manipulated from the outside in those states which are green on the figure. Uh, that is to say, the, the, the states which are somehow stable, and this and the invariant is going to be the characteristic property of those consistent states. I'm going to call them consistent states, states that satisfy the invariant. So this is the life of an object, and the invariant characterizes those states in which the object is observable, meaning it has to be 
consisted. So we're going to look at this a bit more formally. I'm not going to be too formal at the beginning, but let me introduce the notation. The notation actually comes from uh, other work by uh, by the same person, uh, or I'm going to come back to the previous slide in a second here. I'm introducing the, the basic notation. The basic notation, uh, which I hope many of you know, so this will be a reminder, is the so-called uh, whole triple, which is like this, uh, P A Q, where P is a is an assertion something like x is positive you know it's a probability uh, of the state of the program and same thing for q so they are both called assertions and a is an instruction or, or or a program it could be a very big program okay so basically this says if p was true before q will be true afterwards and this is how we characterize the semantics of programs in, in this approach at least and I'm ignoring, for, for those of you who know the details, I'm ignoring the issue of termination, which is not pertinent, pertinent to this discussion. So as an example at the bottom of the slide, uh, if we start from a state in which n, some integer variable, is greater than zero, and I execute n uh, receives n plus one, colon equal is the assignment, then we, uh, we know that we're going to end up in a state satisfying n greater than one, and this is a way to characterize the semantics, the, the meaning, the effect, the abstract effect of the instruction, the assignment instruction, n receives n plus one. Technically, uh, we call P a precondition and Q a postcondition, and they're both assertions. So coming back to uh, the class invariant, the uh, formal uh, version or the approximal, uh, approximate formal version of what I just explained informally about the life of an object is that every creation procedure, every constructor li like uh, this make here must yield a state in which the invariant is satisfied. And then each routine is also going to have its own precondition and its own postcondition. So starting from the precondition, we uh, we must make sure that every constructor C satisfies this postcondition, but also the invariant. And then for every exporter routine, for every public routine R uh, or method R, uh, if we start from the precondition, we want to get to get a postcondition of the routine, of course. But you see that the invariant is now added both to the left and uh, to the right. That is to say, it becomes in, uh, a, something that you can assume when you start and something that you have to guarantee on top of your own postcondition when you end. So you can assume it on top of your precondition on entry and you have to ensure it on top of your own postcondition when you exit. So even though this is uh, uh, formal stuff, I, I hope it's pretty uh, clear. There's nothing particularly difficult mathematically uh, here. By the way, uh, I said uh, assume and ensure. To understand these uh, whole triples with which we're going to play a lot, it's, in, it's interesting, interesting to look at it from the viewpoint of what is good and what is bad. What is good for me as an implementer or as a user and what is bad for me, easy or hard. So if I'm the implementer of A, P is good because it means it restricts the uh, set of cases that I have to handle. So the stronger the precondition is, the, the, the easier my job. For Q, it's the other way around. Of course, Q is something that I have to satisfy. So it's it's my job, you know? So the uh, stronger Q is, the harder my job. Now, if I'm someone who is going to use the instruction A, the perspective is reversed. The uh, precondition P is something that I have to satisfy in order even to be permitted to use A. And, the Q, and Q, of course, is my dessert, right? It's my it's my gratification. It's my uh, uh, recomp it's it's my um, uh, it's what I get as a uh, result, a, a, as a benefit. It's uh, the uh, property that I know will be satisfied on exit. My gratification, if you like. So it's important to remember this dual perspective. Actually, uh, it can be quite confusing at, at times, you know, what's good, what's bad, what, what, what helps, what hurts. So always, we will always keep back, uh, go back to this diagram. So here's a, a, a little example, but somewhat realistic example, not full fledged, but uh, representative of a class invariant. Uh, we, it's something that I typically use in uh, my courses when, when I teach about uh, fundamental object oriented uh, topics. Let's assume we have a uh, list object, an instance of some, uh, uh, I'm sorry, not list, but a, an account object, 
uh, an instance of a class which represents bank accounts. So it's a little bit like the accounting equation I mentioned a few moments ago, uh, but uh, a bit more specific. And it's, it's more like a bank account. And as you can see, we have a record for each bank account of the list of deposits so far and the list of withdrawals so far. So I deposited $400, then $200 and so on. And at some at various points, I withdrew $100, $200, and 200 again, uh, dollars or euros or whatever. Yeah, and so the, and the balance is what I have in my account now. So obviously there is a constraint between those three fields and the constraint is ex as expressed that the balance field is going to be equal to the total of the deposits list minus the total of withdraw the withdrawals list. And I'm assuming a function total, which given one of these lists uh, gives us the sum of all the values deposited or uh, withdrawn. So that's going to be what we have to maintain and is going to be an invariant of the class and is typical of what we do with invariants. And if you look at actual uh, Eiffel code, uh, well written Eiffel code, in particular library code, it has lots of these things which express consistency conditions that make classes and objects significant. An object, to uh, mention it again, is not just some big heap of zeros and ones or integers and booleans. It's actually the representation of some interesting structure with the semantics behind it, and that semantics is expressed by the consistency constraints, in other words, the invariants. So if we do, uh, if we perform an operation on accounts, like, like depositing, depositing some money in the account, we have to ensure our own post condition which is indicated here. Okay, you can see that this is the post condition of the deposit operation, which says that the, uh, just to concentrate on the first clause, uh, the, pro the balance is going to be equal to whatever it was before plus sum. And sure, by the way, is the syntax for post conditions and require is the syntax for uh, preconditions. And, and so how does the code work? Well, it, uh, it, it has to do two things. It adds an element So, for example, I'm depositing 300 uh, euros or whatever. Uh, so I have to create an element. This is what this line says. It creates a, a little object and it adds it extend to the end of the list. But of course, at this point, we're evaluating the invariant, right? Because the balance is not accurate anymore. So we have to update the balance. Okay. Uh, and now the invariant is satisfied again. So you see the idea, it was expressed by the whole triples before. Uh, we can assume that the invariant holds an entry. Otherwise, you know, if the database is inconsistent, then uh, all bets are off. We cannot reason about our stuff. And we, so this is a plus, you know, if you remember my little uh, smiley uh, face, this is uh, this is something that we can rejoice that because we we have we can assume it on on entry, but of course it's our responsibility, uh, our responsibility like the responsibility of every routine in the class also to uh, restore it on top of our official goal. Our official job is to. By our own post condition, which is our specific job, but on top on top of that, there is a kind of general a global obligation on every operation, which is to restore the invariant, assuming it was satisfied on uh, entry. So this is the sad face in the uh, whole triple. So yeah, we, we uh, this uh, this is going to update the balance to now 800 since we have deposited 300. So what, what this illustrates is that in almost all realistic examples, the invariant is not something that never varies in spite of the name. It's something that is, it's a property that is satisfied in those uh, stable state, in those consistent states that appeared in the earlier uh, figure. Those uh, before and after every qualified call, but in between the invariant might be violated, which is my, my, uh, what my little blobs here suggest. These are inconsistent states, states in which the invariant is not satisfied, and that's perfectly okay. And as you can see from the example, it's inevitable. You, there's no way that you can both 
update the uh, deposits list and update the balance at the same time. Uh, even concurrency wouldn't work here. By the way, I'm assuming a sequential uh, context for the moment, the pro problems are difficult enough uh, like this. But even with concurrent programming, there's no way we could do uh, both. So there, even if you reverse the order of the instructions, there's still going to be a state in between, like uh, here, where the invariant is violated. So it's part of life. You, uh, you, in order to do something useful, you kind of destroy the existing order. And of course, as a good citizen, when you're done, you restore the uh, expected uh, order. And this is compatible with the formal description that I gave, okay? Where uh, the, the these are pre-post specifications, the invariant has to be satisfied uh, before, and it has to be satisfied after. This doesn't say anything about in between. So here's a kind of general execution picture, which uh, gives us uh, a better, uh, a more general idea because uh, there are several objects. You can see the lifetimes of various objects, S uh, for supplier, C1 and C2, which are its two uh, clients. So you can see that C1 executes some um, uh, qualified call and X happens to be S. Uh, maybe I could have written S dot Q of A here. Then uh, S uh, does some stuff and returns to C1. Then later on, or maybe just at that point, another client C2 triggers. Um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. Later on, a uh, the, the, this object uh, C2 is going to call R, which later on returns. Okay. So this is the general view with this. Uh, it's the execution model that we're going to assume. We have a number of uh, objects. One of these objects at any particular point in time is the active object. It's the one that is executing, but any object which has called it and is, has not finished its call or uh, recursively uh, is going to be called an active object. So an active object is simply an object of the cold chain. At the end of the cold chain, you have the current object. Now, okay, this is a beautiful uh, picture, but it turns out to be a Patyomkin uh, facade, a uh, Patyomkin village, because behind the facade, there is a lot of uh, disorder. It would mean that everything is simple and, co and coherent. Basically, uh, we have the application to object-oriented programming of the notion of recursion, recursive proof in mathematics, right? Well, the, the first part here, that's the uh, base step of the proof. Uh, we, we, we check that the initial states, of course, there's more than one possible S1, so all state like S1 satisfy the invariant, and then we prove that every, in any state that satisfies the invariant, okay, if we apply any operation, it will still satisfy the invariant afterwards. So this is exactly like a proof by induction in mathematics in which you prove P of zero, then you prove that P of N implies P of N plus one for any N, and then you can deduce that P of N holds for any N. So this would be very nice were it not for some nasty problems that arise. Because, why? Why do they arise? They arise because of the power of object oriented programming. We have very powerful mechanisms at our disposal in the form of modern programming languages, and uh, these mechanisms call havoc. We're going to have three problems: callback, furtive access, which is related to callback, which is very close, and reference leak, which is an in, in a different league altogether. I'm going to use this working example, uh, which uh, which is interesting because it uh, highlights all three problems. So I have a class first. It's a very simple example. Let me show you some uh, some actual objects, uh, a runtime run situation which illustrates the class. So as you can see, a class, the, the class has two attributes. So the objects have uh, two uh, fields, is married, which is a Boolean, 
and a spouse, which is a person, detachable means that it can be void. Okay, iPhone is void safe in the sense that you cannot have null pointer dereferencing in Eiffel, so that's one of the big advantages of the language. And so if uh, normally, if you just say person, this thing has to be non-null, non-void. But if you say detachable person, it could be void. And of course, not everyone is married, so spouse is uh, going to be detachable. And the invariant is going to tell us that uh, you cannot be married to yourself, okay? Spouse not equal to current. Current is the current object. It's the same thing as this in uh, C++ or Java. And then it's going to tell us that is married is married is true if and only if a spouse is attached. Um, this line here is at the wrong place. Uh, attached spouse means the same thing as uh, spouse not equal to void. And then is if if I'm married, then the spouse of my spouse, the spouse of my spouse is me. Okay. So uh, this is the invariant property that characterizes this, uh, this simple class. Uh, later on, I'm going to ignore things about uh, not, mar not being married to yourself. Uh, it's, it's irrelevant for this discussion. It's important in practice, but irrelevant for this discussion. And what I'm trying to do is to write a routine marry. And it's actually non-trivial. It's a real challenge problem for object-oriented verification. So uh, we're going to see two versions of this procedure. Uh, the precondition is that in order to get married, I shouldn't be married and my spouse shouldn't be married. And the post condition is that um, then after a married spouse will be equal to the argument, other, I, I'll be married and my spouse is going to be married. I don't need to say spouse dot spouse equals current because this will follow from the last clause of the Invariant. So the problem is how to write Mary. So you can see the, the two possible situations here for an object, uh, one in which uh, we have a bachelor object, non-married, and one in which we have two objects which are married to each other. Again, and as, as I said, we're going to ignore uh, the point about not marrying yourself. So the callback is general is, is the following situation. Uh, we have during the execution of routine G, where, by the way, the invariant can be evaluated as represented uh, here. We call another routine, okay, all this is normal, and P, this routine is going to call back and to come back, and we, we call this other routine on an object Y. However, what happens if this routine P, this thing on the left is P, right, if it actually calls into X by doing X dot whatever. Then it's going to find the object in an inconsistent state, which is bad. And so we are going to have it here in our working example. Let me let me try to, to write Mary in a recursive fashion. You know? So here's the code to marry other. I'm going to set my spouse to other, to, to make other my spouse, then of course, since it's recursive, we, we want to, infinite, to avoid infinite recursion. If I just said other dot Mary, sorry, uh, yeah, we can keep this. Uh, if I just said this other dot Mary recursive of myself, in principle it works, but of course it will cause infinite recursion. So I protect this by saying if other dot spouse is void. Only in that case do I do it. If other dot spouse is not void, then we uh, already uh, we, we don't need to recurse once more. And then I said is married to true. So remember the invariant which uh, is repeated here. Well, when we try to access other here, it violates the invariant because the invariant says that um, uh, if uh, is uh, that is married is uh, true if and only if attached spouse and this in the recursive call is going to be false because I have already set other. So spouse, sorry, I have already set spouse, sorry. Uh, and so spouse is not void, but is married is not true uh, anymore. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, is married is uh, it's the other way around. Is married is still false, okay? It's still not true. 
and so you can play with this, you know, if you if you have a, a long uh, uh, summer nights uh, which you don't know how to occupy, uh, play with this, try to reorganize the instructions. And I can tell you there is no way you can move things around, you know, shuffle instructions uh, without causing an invariant validation due to this uh, callback or, or some other equivalent callback. So it's really disturbing. The next problem, furtive access, is going to be similar, but it occurs in the absence, even in the absence of callbacks. So basically, what happens is that we have object A, which is trying to build an object B. We're going to see this in the example of the observer pattern. So we are building an object B, and we have to do it step by step, and we cannot we cannot obtain the invariant of the object B right away. So we have to do a little bit of uh, messing up with the internals of B, which is fine because at the end, the, uh, the purpose of all this messing up is that in the end, the other object will be consistent, will satisfy its invariant. But in the meantime, it's not the case and we're going to run into invariant violations. So here, this is my class observer. Okay, so it's a very simplified observer. Every object has only one observer. Of course, in the real observer pattern, an object can have many observers. So you can see that there is a subject which has some data. I'm assuming it to be just X, which is an integer, and which is being observed, right? So it has an observer, and then whenever it does something which could modify X, it's going to tell the observer, hey, you, our observer, update yourself. And update simply is simply there to guarantee the invariant of the uh, observer or to restore the invariant of the observer, which is that my cache, my, my proxy for the subject's value is equal to that value. That's the whole purpose of having an observer, right? Is that I keep a kind of cache of the observed value. And so to do this, I just need to do x receives subject dot x. Well, when I do observer dot update, so this is very simple code. It's code that we teach in the first semester, right? That's uh, of, uh, of, uh, of programming. When, when we in interactive programming, when we explain uh, basic uh, patterns, the problem is that this um, invariant will be uh, violated uh, by update because the observer does not satisfy its invariant. Of course, it doesn't satisfy the invariant because X has just been changed. And the whole purpose of observer.update is to restore the invariant. But then if we, for example, if we, if instead of static verification, we're doing runtime monitoring of assertions, we're going to be caught by a message which says, oh, you're trying to achieve to, to access observer, uh, it doesn't satisfy the invariant. Ha ha, uh, got, got you. Okay, well, of course got me, but it's because I was trying to help. It's this situation of trying to build another object, or in this case to uh, correct, to fix another object by restoring its invariant, but in the process, it's all messed up. So an another example of, uh, of um, furtive access is in my person example. An we could do it in a non-recursive way. So this procedure is called Mary Stepwise, and uh, you know, it uses auxiliary uh, routines. It's, it says, okay, let's have a little utility routine, a set of routines, set married, which simply sets is married to true and sets spouse. Uh, the indentation is bad, but uh, you, you, can, you, you can see it. It sets the spouse to other, right? So it doesn't, it, it, uh, they don't, play where they don't touch the invariant, they don't uh, satisfy the invariant, they're just little utility routines. And as a result, in Eiffel, they are going to be declared like this, meaning they're exported selectively. They're only usable from class person. We don't want any other class to be able to use them because they are little utility routines. So it's like friends in C++, you know, restricted exports. So I do this set married, uh, uh, in the uh, Mary stepwise procedure, set married, other dot set married, set spouse, and other set, set spouse in some order. So I know that if I do all four, everything's going to be fine. That's precisely the purpose of doing it. Doing it. I'm going to restore the invariant on both myself and other. The problem is that as soon as I try to uh, to uh, attack 
other to, to do something with other, I violate its invariant. And of course, I violate its invariant. That's the whole purpose is that I'm trying to restore its invariant, but I'm doing it step by step. So there's no way in the intermediate steps I can get the invariant. And once again, you know, it's my challenge here. Uh, it's not possible to uh, um, reorder the uh, instructions so that we don't get a uh, an invariant validation. So this is very, 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 very bad. Okay. The, the simple notion of invariant completely breaks down. Uh, I'll, I'll skip this. The, uh, the third problem is reference leak, which in some ways is even worse. Well, it's hard to say which one uh, is the worst. So uh, I'm still using the same example. So re and a reference leak is going to be the fact, uh, the, the really sad and scary fact that I can invalidate an invariant of an object without even touching that object, without even performing any operation that applies explicitly to that object. So here, I uh, they're not called uh, um, Bill and Melinda anymore, they're called uh, Alice and uh, Bob, and there's a, there's a third guy, uh, Charles. We are going to invalidate the invariant of Charles without doing any operation on, I'm sorry, we're going to invalidate the invariant of Bob without doing any operation on Bob. So you can see what I do here. I have created Alice, Bob, and Charles. So I have three objects and they're all initialized. So they're bachelor, they're not married, uh, their spouse fields are void. So now Alice is going to marry Bob. I should have some music here, the Mendelssohn's uh, wedding uh, march. Uh, sorry, I forgot that, but it, it doesn't go through the microphone anyway. So uh, this is the situation that results from Alice marrying uh, Bob. And then uh, Alice now has a better idea and she decides to divorce Bob. Okay, so uh, which is here. So what is divorce? Divorce is, is buggy. Div divorce is buggy because it, well, it's buggy at least in an informal sense. Because it only sets his married to false and spouse to void. And so uh, I don't know if uh, if we can make this interactive. Let me not try, but you know I would uh, think about it. Why uh, why is divorce baggy? Well, in some in some ways, it is not baggy. At least formally, it is not baggy. You can verify that it it conserves it preserves the invariant. However, things are bad, They're really bad, because what what happens here is that now we have this uh, situation where Alice has, okay, divorced. So, uh, yeah. So now Alice, Alice divorces Bob, so um, his marriage is false and Alice is no longer connected to Bob. However, aha, and this is where disaster threatens Bob, Still, still thinks it's married to Alice. I'm saying it because let's not anthropomorphize too much. These are objects, not people. And next, um, uh, Alice has found someone better. So Alice is going to marry Charles. And uh, well, the Charles object satisfies its invariant spouse that spouse is equal to current same thing for alice but you, you can see that bob now uh, spouse that spouse is charles okay so this is really bad because i've achieved this without performing any operation on uh, bob i've invalidated the inv invalidated the invariant of bob and worse yet the class is in some sense correct now, if you remember the whole triple specification of the class uh, before, uh, it, the, it said that every exported routine has to preserve the invariant. And if Mary is, is uh, yeah, I'm assuming here that we, we have been able to write Mary. Uh, previously, I showed you uh, the difficulty of writing Mary, but I'm assuming that we do have a working Mary procedure which preserves the invariant. So if we have that, uh, Mary preserves the invariant and divorce preserves the invariant. So the class is in some sense correct. And the reason I'm saying it's buggy is that if we take the global perspective, perspective, then of course, Mary uh, or divorce, sorry, should also update the previous spouse. 
So this is easy to fix, okay? We can uh, make sure that we also divorce uh, Charles, uh, the, uh, the, previous, the Bob, I'm sorry. In this case, the, the previous previous spouse. So we have to set spouse that is married is married to false and uh, spouse that spouse to, to vote. So this is easy to change and it would correct the bug. The problem is that it's a bug because I tell you it's a bug and because you understand it's a bug because we all understand, we all understand that if I'm divorced, my former spouse is no longer married to me. Uh, but uh, this is informal and it's not reflected in the in the rule. So that is really, really bad. So there was an example of this in uh, many, many uh, years ago in my uh, first object to software construction uh, book, uh, 88, with uh, houses and residents and the same, same idea. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, start giving you a glimpse of, um, uh, of uh, solutions. I've talked about the problems and I'll only give you a glimpse of uh, sol solutions. I think I've have about five minutes left, so uh, I'll be very quick uh, on the approaches to uh, solutions. Uh, there's, lot of, there's a lot of work in this area. Okay? Uh, so typically what this work does it's, is that it adds annotations. It, it forces programmers to write all kinds of things like uh, wrap and unwrap. So this is actually work in which I was involved, uh, but it, it, it's probably, uh, it's an important step in the resolution of these problems, but I don't believe that it's the last, the last uh, work. In particular, what we've tried to do in this work is to avoid annotations completely. Okay, So there, there's no new language construct, no annotation. People, of course, have to write a class invariance. That's normal, but no, no more. So this was, uh, yeah, w one thing to note, we're going to look at um, inference rules and, and the, the general, so the, the the, uh, the inference rules that we, so yeah, we're going to look at inference rules. This is how we reason about uh, programs. We have four triples on both sides, up and down. And uh, upstairs, uh, we have a, 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 an antecedent. Downstairs, we have a consequence. So the general style of uh, horror axiomatics is that in order to prove the, in order to make it possible to prove certain program constructs, we have to show that some other constructs hold some pro satisfy some, some properties. And we have the usual uh, happy face, uh, sad face uh, uh, that we had before. So the classical routine rule is for, it's not object oriented. And it basically says this. If we have a routine R, so this is the body of the routine with some formal arguments F, F is the formal arguments, with a pre, then if we can prove that the body satisfies its contract, that is to say, it goes from its precondition to its postcondition, then any call is going to satisfy the same thing with the formal arguments replaced by actual arguments. So this is a very powerful rule. It, uh, this version ignores recursion, but basically what it says is that in order to prove all possible calls to a routine, the properties of all possible calls to a routine, it suffices to have proved once and for all the corresponding property of the body of the routine itself. So it's kind of the basis for abstraction. So it's it remains applicable to unquantified calls. In object-oriented programming, we still have R of A, which is a call on the current object on this. But in object-oriented programming, we have qualified calls. So if we transpose to object-oriented programming, we, uh, we include the uh, current object, but more importantly, if we insert the invariant, then this is what we get, right? Invariant added to the pre and the post condition here on the supplier side and here on the client side, x dot inf. What's interesting with this rule is that it's completely uninteresting. Okay? It's sound. There's no question about it, but it's completely uninteresting because it's just the transposition of the non-object oriented rule. And um, it, um, it it forces you to, as a client, to re-establish the invariant each time. And so this is the negation of the benefit of mathematical induction. Well, what I what I said earlier is that when we start a, when we start an operation, we have to be able to assume 
the invariant on entry. So here, if we have to re-establish it for each call, then we lose the benefit of the invariant. The invariant is, becomes just a part, a, a, an assertion that is repeated in every pre and post condition, and we just factor it out for, for readability, but that's not very useful. Uh, question to the organizers, can I have another uh, five or uh, five to seven minutes, or is it a problem? Because otherwise I'll just conclude. Just, uh, you, uh, okay. Okay, so I'll finish at the quarter two, is that, is that okay? Well, I'll take this as a yes. So, okay, this we saw. Now, we are going to, so all the reference rules, so what we want to have is, we want to get rid of this inv here. Okay, we had the inv, we don't want it anymore. We want to be able just to use the precondition. Unfortunately, because of the three problems that I mentioned, it doesn't work like this. So we would be, we would want to have to, to be able to be to, to benefit from the invariant and entry without doing anything, and then we benefit from it again on exit. We are going to write rules like this because they're all of the same form. We're going to ignore the pre and the post condition because they they will always appear. And it's always going to be R uh, here and X dot R there. So we're just going to write inf, inf, as you can see here, and whatever we, we have. So we are just going to look at what is necessary pre and post upstairs and downstairs. So the ideal rule, the rule that we really want is for the, for what I have to prove. For the routine, it's inf and inf, inf pre, inf post. And for what I can deduce for calls, I can deduce x dot int, but I don't have to uh, to ensure it on entry. And there are three things that defe defeat this uh, ideal situation: callbacks, um, qualify, um, um, furtive access, and um, so I I'm going to. Yeah, I'm going to skip the proof and show uh, how to deal with the removal of these three assumptions. First assumption, assume that we have a callback. So the new part is this, okay? So it's very important to understand that this, so, so this is new, okay? It, uh, it, it, uh, no one, as far as I know, has proposed it before, except me in a previous paper, which was not published, a working paper on archive. So the idea is that when you go out, you clean up because you might have to come back. So it's really important to understand that this is the case of going out. So before you go out, we satisfy the invariant of this object. So coming back to this form here, this invariant is not x dot inf, right? It's inv. That is to say, in order to prepare for callbacks, we wrap the current object. We, we make it consistent. So that takes care of callbacks. The second problem was furtive access. If, and so here, there is an observation that people have not made before, which is that when you have furtive access in, a, in any well-written piece of code that I've seen, it's always associated with selective exports. That is to say, it has to do with routines that are only exported to some classes. And so we're going to take advantage of this with a mechanism which uh, we call slicing. So consider an invariant which says, for example, that X is not equal to Y, that A greater than zero and some probability of Y where they're all exported to different classes. And we have a routine R, which is also exported to only to some classes, like update in the observer example, which in fact is the case here. You can see that update is only exported to subject, right? We, we, should, we don't want to allow any client to update the observer. It's only the subject that can do this. So it's very important from information hiding perspective 
to limit this. And so the invariant sliced by R is the part of the invariant made of clauses that involve features having no more visibility than R. So we're going to remove all the clauses that have more visibility because they are, so, so to speak, above our pay grades. If we are a really restricted routine, we should only have to worry about things which are as restricted as uh, we are. So this is in flash R. And the new rule is, go is going to be that here we slice. So we only need to assume the sliced invariant. And this rule actually works well in cases like uh, uh, the observer pattern, and uh, as far as I can see in the marriage, the non recursive marriage example. And then the last problem was reference leak. So remember reference leak in which we had two dependent objects. Okay, the, uh, the example was uh, the persons, and we have an object here uh, which refers to this object on the right, and it has its an invariant something that depends on A. And same thing for the other, is something that depends on B. And A and B are this object on the right. And so this was the case of the marriage counterexample in which we invalidate the invariant of another object which depends on us. So the full rule would be something like this. If we call depths all the dependence of the object, all the ones that have references to it in their invariants, we have to show that the routine satisfy or restores not only the invariant, but the invariant on all the dependents. Okay, this, so this is the ideal rule, if you like. It's, it's sound. Unfortunately, it's not implementable in a modular way because how do you know the dependent on, on an, of an object? So there's a weaker rule, which is also new, uh, which says uh, we are going to weaken the assertions on which we can rely by using only the local part of the invariant. The local part of the invariant is anything that does not depend on any other object. For So for example, uh, n greater than zero is local, but this one, the second one is not local. And so here, and it's really tricky to remember what, what's, you know, the smiley faces, the sad and happy faces. This is actually a, a sad face because it enables us to assume less when we do the proof, but then it works, then it's sound. And, and uh, unfortunately, I don't have time for the proof of soundness, but it, it's there. So uh, what uh, what this has uh, shown, well, what this work is uh, yielding uh, is a general proof rule for object-oriented programming, which as far as I know, didn't really exist. And the only versions that existed the only methodologies that existed imposed a large amount of annotation on the programmer. So in this case, there are no new language constructs, no new programmer annotations. Of course, in some cases, you might have to tweak your code a little bit, like in the marriage case, uh, re reordering the instructions of Mary. But this is true of verification in uh, general, in the sense that uh, it's very seldom that you can just take existing code and uh, prove it correct. You usually have to adapt it a little bit in order to make it provable. And so in this respect, I think this uh, work uh, has made at least a valiant attempt to uh, justify uh, Chico Marx's comment that yes, indeed, there is a sanity clause. <laughs>